So hello, everybody. I'm Gary Bates, CEO of Creation Ministries International US. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Robert Carter. I am a scientist with Creation Ministries International. So today we said at the intro, Rob, we're going to be talking about the incredible fourth or four dimensional genome. I think that term or expression probably freaks everybody out and they say, oh, this is for nerds. I don't get this stuff. Not for me. So before we uh, before we start, why don't we break it down and do a little kind of genetics 101? Because we all use terms and even lay people hear terms like DNA and the genome. Uh, what do they really mean? So I'm going to be looking at some notes, obviously, as we go along today. So um, the DNA, I often describe this as kind of a chemical hard drive in the nucleus of the cell of every living Good creature, whether you're a frog, a fish, a caterpillar, or a human being. In the nucleus of our cells, we have this chemical hard drive that stores lots and lots of uh, information. So that's the DNA. Now, a gene, if we like, a gene is a set of instructions. So we might think about it as a sentence because the DNA code is composed of four letters, GCAT, and it's the order of those letters that literally reads like a book that convey, conveys information and tells the cell and all the machinery in the cell what to do. So a gene is like a paragraph or a sentence, and the genome is like the library, a complete library set of instructions. You think that's, a, although a very simple analogy, do you think that's a decent way of describing it? Yeah, you're doing a great job. That's an excellent introductory description of what a genome is. So I've been with CMI uh, as a volunteer and full-time actually for about 30 years. And even in my time, uh, when we were talking about the, the DNA, to be frank, we didn't know that much about it. But scientists thought it had one particular function only. Uh, what was that? Back in the day, back in the stone ages of genetics, we're talking about you know, 1990, 2000, um, we had this thing called the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. It actually comes out of the 1940s. Some scientists back then said, hey, if we have to ex explain life using a code, well, we have to have an instruction, and that instruction does something. But that's not the way the genome operates. It's so much more complicated than that. It's like this instruction does something, but it also does something else. And if you take it and break it apart into pieces, it does other things in other places at other times. And the computer scientists are looking at the genome and are scratching their heads saying, we don't write computer programs like this. It's too complicated. And that's the fun mm -hmm. thing when, when you get into genetics. Let, let's say it this way. If life were really simple, evolution might be possible. But the more complex life really is, the less possible evolution is. And when we look at DNA, when we look at the genome, we look at the the computer code that controls us, it's so incredibly complicated, it actually boggles the mind. So the genome argues yeah. against Darwinism. Yeah, it does. So we often thought that the DNA really just coded the cell to basically build proteins, right? Proteins yeah. are what we're all made of, uh, et cetera. But now we know that the DNA, and we're going to discuss some of this too, has many, many different functions besides just coding for proteins. I mean, yeah. it's got incredible codes for repair systems. It has codes for building the machines that repair the letter mistakes in the DNA. So we're going to talk about how this genome operates in four dimensions. Uh, maybe I can start, and feel free to correct me when I'm wrong because you're the geneticist, Rob, all right? Okay. Um, the four-dimensional genome, uh, let's talk about one aspect. The first genome, the first dimension, uh, we'll use an engineering analogy. If we could stretch out a single strand, right, yep. of our DNA, so it's coiled double, it's a double helix, let's take one strand, stretch it out as thin as it is, okay, uh, we'd have about 50 kilometers of worth of DNA. It'd be about 50 kilometers long if it was and for you americans listening a, a kilometer is a little bit more than half a mile it's about 30 miles so if it was the thickness of a human hair and we stretched it out it'd be about 50 kilometers long crunch it up and it would uh, maybe be about the size of a golf ball something 
like yeah. that. So it's very, very compact. The compression levels for storing data are, again, mind-boggling. Phenomenal, yeah. Uh, com- computer scientists to try to study the DNA as a method of, in fact, storing information yeah. uh, for our, or, uh, for our uh, own computers. So these are instructions that tell the cell uh, what to build uh, and, and all the complex machines in the cell. Now, while we're talking here, uh, we're going to throw up uh, animation of something called a kinesin. We have it on our website at creation.com in the media center, a little walking robot. And every step that this robot takes across these uh, paths, pathways that are constructed and deconstructed behind it as it walks, uh, it uses uh, uh, energy. Uh, ATP. Known, known as ATP, which is then constructed by another machine. And this guy is basically a postman. As he's walking along, he's delivering um, instructions to different parts of the machines to tell them what to do. Just take a look at this. Inside a living cell is an amazing transportation system. Proteins have to be delivered to the correct part of the cell to perform their intended functions. This animation, based on a lot of clever research over a number of years, shows how it happens. Highways, made of microtubules, are assembled by interlocking proteins, each manufactured in accordance with the coded instructions on the cell's DNA. Marching along a microtubule is the Kinesian motor, the hero of our story, carrying a huge sack of proteins to be delivered in a predetermined place in the cell. Here, the proteins will be released to fulfill their functions. A Kinesian linear motor uses one ATP to provide the energy for each step and takes 125,000 steps to cover one millimeter. This amazing machine shows all the hallmarks of design. So uh, that's just one of the machines that that set of instruction uh, codes for. So Rob, what's, uh, what do we do to describe this, this, the second dimension of the genome? You know, when I was... Uh, studying genomics, I'm trying to explain it in a creation context. I was really wrestling with it because it was so complicated. I needed a way to explain it that made sense. And I had this eureka moment. I said, oh, the genome is not just a string. It's not just one dimension. It's multiple dimensions. In fact, I figured out that it had four dimensions. And that eureka moment led to uh, my favorite talk I've ever given, ever, in the history of my creation talking, it's called the High Tech Cell, which is available on creation.com. It also led to the publication of an article called The Four Dimensional Human Genome Defies Naturalistic Expectations or Explanations. It's also on creation.com. The link will be appearing, I'm sure. Those two things for me are honestly one of the coolest and most exciting things I've ever done. And it's the idea that you have a string of called DNA. It's six feet long. It's about almost two meters long in every single one of your cells. And there's a code on it. But that code has a code that affects other places in the code. So if you want to draw it out, you'd have to have a two-dimensional sheet of all the letters and then say, okay, this group of letters interacts with this group of letters and this group of letters turns off this group of letters and this group of letters goes over here and turns on this group of letters. So it is like a a mesh or a network of con- of connections all throughout the genome. That's the second dimension. And it's just right there, super complicated, unbelievably complex. Now, our computer programs do this. We have, um, you hear computer programmers, they talk about writing in lines of code. Well, a line is a one-dimensional object in math. But our computer programs, this piece of code does something over here, and this piece of code interacts with this piece over here. We have a very two-dimensional sort of a computer programming system. But it's much more complicated than our computers, our genome is. Yeah, because we're now going to get into, if you like, the third dimension. So I mentioned the double helix before. So the way that DNA is replicated is it's unwound. It's read by another machine, right? It goes along and just reads that strand of DNA. It's called transcription. Then it takes that information, goes and parks it somewhere else, rewrites it, and then we see that strand folded. Okay, correct? This is what we're talking about. This is where it's folded. So when you bend that line and it folds over, it's able to interact 
with another section of that code. That's what happens when this DNA is folded. So this is incredible to think that you write a line of code here, you move it, and it not only works in its place there, but now it's going to affect something else along that line of code. Quite incredible. Uh, anything else you want to add about oh. that? I'm, I'm, I oh, have to simplify did. analogies because I'm not a geneticist. But you did a great job of just scratching the surface. When we start looking at the shape of the chromosomes inside our nucleus, it's not what anyone expected. You know, back in the day, they, they thought the genome was mostly junk because only 2% of the genome codes for protein, while the rest of it is just doesn't do anything. And yes. 98% of it is just junk. That is so not the true. The greatest mistake, Rob, in the history possibly of evolution, if not, I mean, certainly evolutionary biology, but we're all told that 98% of our DNA is leftover junk from our evolutionary ancestry. I, in fact, I have to be honest, I don't want to be too critical, incredible arrogance, because we don't yeah. know what something does, oh, it must be a, an evolutionary vestige. Yeah. There's a lot of information on creation.com, specifically in a couple of articles I've written about junk DNA and why it's so necessary for evolutionary theory. But man, that's another rabbit trail. Maybe we'll do another podcast on that yeah. in the future. Um, but the three-dimensional genome, the reason this is so cool is because yeah, you've got a bunch of spacer regions that don't code for protein. Fine. But those spacer regions, first of all, are super active in controlling which genes are turned on and turned off. But they also control how the chromosome folds. One of the first things that scientists did after the human genome was published in, uh, I think, 2003, is they looked at genes that are used together in biological pathways. So if you want to produce, you know, the color in your skin or grow a hair follicle or anything like that, you need a whole bunch of genes. Well, they said, we predict that genes that are used together will be found next to each other in the genome. And they yep. weren't. They were randomly scattered across the genome and they concluded, ah, see that? It's just a bunch of junk. It's just millions of years of evolutionary experiments and the genome is really inefficient and blah, blah, blah. But then someone said, hey, wait a second. If you treat a cell with formaldehyde, the DNA will chemically react with itself and it'll cross-link. And then if you chop the DNA up, you get all these DNA X's. And if you sequence the arms of those X's, you can see what genes are next to each other in three-dimensional space. What they found out was that the genes that are used together are found next to each other in 3D. They could be right. on different chromosomes. So instead of being random, it's actually positioned specifically so that when the chromosomes fold up, the, those genes that are used together will be properly grouped inside the nucleus. I mean, this is crazy. Yeah. It's not supposed to be true. So when they're, fold, when they're folded up, the sentence, the instructions make sense again, essentially, mm. is what you're saying. Oh, so, that's cool. It'd be yeah. like having a book and all the words are scrambled. But if you origami the book just right, you can actually read the book. So the fourth dimension, the fourth dimension, Rob. So all yes. this is occurring at once. Yep. The fourth dimension is time. And this was another big surprise. The genome changes over time in multiple ways. Mm. First of all, the genes that are turned on and off, that changes over time. You don't need the same genes as an adult that you needed when you were in your mother's womb or during puberty. You don't need the same genes when you're healthy as you need when you're sick. So genes have to turn on and turn off over time. But in order to do that, the genome changes shape. If you need this gene that's buried in the genome because now you're sick, well, your chromosomes will fold in a different way, bring that gene out, turn it on and use it. And when you don't need it anymore, it packs it away again. So that's a three-dimensional change over time. This is a four-dimensional system. But it's yeah. even bigger, bigger or deeper than that. The genome dynamically rep reprograms itself. Your brain cells have different genomes. There are pieces of DNA in one brain cell that's not found in another brain cell. As you're developing, the genome is literally reprogramming itself to make you. Your liver cells have different genomes. Your this is not supposed to be true. The genome is supposed to be simple. We don't use, in our computers, we don't 
make computer programs that change themselves over time. Lots of experiments have been done yeah. with that. That usually leads to just chaos and the whole system breaks down. We have to very carefully control our computer programs. Modern cell biology is really like information technology. We've been kind yeah. of using those terms to try to comprehend it. And, uh, you know, I, I hope we've done a good job in trying to simplify it, but it, it is a very, very complex subject. That's what makes it so amazing, studying God's design. It, what it does is make you sit back and your eyes open up. You say, wow, I can't believe this is true. and brings glory to God. So it's not well, you bad said to be complicated. It, it, defies, it defies evolutionary expectations. All yes. of this complexity, how could it come about by chance, random uh, processes? You know, what I wanted to say there was, in, in one sense, it's a bit like saying, well, let's take our Windows uh, operating system. But this operating system actually has all of the software to run millions of different programs that might come about at the same time. Oh, but now, now we have a new computer over here. So let's get the same operating system that's running all that. And it's also going to run this new machine at the same time. And then this is what the DNA does. On so many levels, it operates and runs literally everything and every aspect uh, of the, the cell. So the conclusion, there is a master designer. When you think about yes. how many years it took just to decode the human genome, and as you say, when they looked at it, they still didn't know what everything did. Right. And would you think that we could still uncover layers of complexity, Rob, that we don't even know about yet? Absolutely. We're continually discovering new things in the genome that are shocking and surprising. When they sequence no. a genome, they said, we're going to understand it. And then they looked at it and said, we don't understand this because it's not what anyone expected. Yeah, there's 98, 98, 98 junk there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, folks, uh, that, again, like all these podcasts, is just here to wet your whistle. So you can go onto our website and our Q&A. There's a whole section headed genetics, lots and lots of articles. Rob is one of the leaders in our ministry for helping us uh, scrutinize our information and uh, help us with the subtlety of our own arguments because operational science is like this. This is what we're talking about. We will discover something tomorrow that we didn't know today. But what we can be sure of, Rob, is there is an incredible master designer if you like, a, uh, an intelligence, a will from beyond our universe that has imposed his will on matter to arrange it into incredibly complex organisms. You know, when we think about the complexity of the human body and all the functions we have, and it's all coded, all controlled by a set of instructions in the DNA molecule. Absolutely incredible. Just want to remind people, Rob mentioned his talk. The High Tech Cell, there's the DVD. It's also available as a, as a download. I remember uh, I was at a conference in Canada with you and you gave that talk. Actually, sorry, in, uh, in Asheville, North yeah, Carolina, when Asheville, you gave that North talk Carolina. for the first time. And uh, you got a standing ovation for it. So well worth getting. So before we wrap up, Rob, uh, any last thoughts? I just want to encourage the audience that life is complicated and that's what is amazing about it. It is fun to study. It is fun to be humbled with what we don't know. And as we learn about biology, we are actually learning about the mind of God. Absolutely. And that's why it's exciting, actually, to be a creationist, unlike what people think. We haven't parked our brains at the church door. Not at all. So, folks at home, if, uh, if you like this, don't forget to share it with your friends. This is the type of information you could just drop in somebody's lap, because in one sense, it kind of speaks for itself. Could evolution produce, produce this? Absolutely not. If you like these, don't forget to subscribe and, uh, and click like each time. So we'll see you next time on Creation Talk. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. You're welcome. Bye, everybody.